<laughs> Welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here. This is Abiding Love Lutheran Church. It is a place of peace. We come into this setting literally through different doors. We come from different backgrounds and experiences. We come with certain biases and paradigms and ways of thinking, ways we've been raised, ways in which life has challenged our notions of faith and understanding about what's going on in the world. So we want to recognize that up front and welcome the diversity of thought and background that is here because that will make this rich. Um, Anything else that you'd like to add to that, Bob? <clears throat> when we had lunch on Wednesday, we were talking about um, what we were going to do, if we were going to rehearse anything before we got together, and we decided we're not going to do that. We've been in conversation for 17 years mm -hmm. on these matters, Brad and I, as a scientist and, and as a pastor, <clears throat> and we're just going to continue the conversation. Okay. And it, so I'm going to start off. Um, talking about the, the goals of this talk, and there are, there are seven of them. <clears throat> the first is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this whole business of, of physics. Um, some, some of what we're going to talk about is theoretical, meaning there are models for, for what we perceive to be happening, and some of it is just experimental, meaning um, uh, people do these wacko experiments and strange things are, are observed. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the, the big discovery that energy is quantized. The next I'm going to talk about that life, light is quantized. I'm going to go into detail on these. This is just uh, the overview of the talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the wave particle duality. Gill has found some wonderful films about that. Um, I'm going to talk about the uncertainty principle, which you've probably heard of some. And then I'm, this is the meat of the talk. I'm going to talk about what quantum physics actually is. And when I started, when, I, when I've seen a lot of talks, even by some famous quantum physicists talk about quantum physics, they never, they, they hide the real stuff behind the curtain. So they assume that you're too dumb to figure it out. I'm not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna show some equations. Not, not that you have to understand them, but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to show you the whole works, okay? So I hope that you end up with, if somebody comes up to you after this talk and says, what is quantum physics or what is quantum mechanics, you'll be able to answer them, okay, intelligently. Uh, then finally, we're going to talk about some of the benefits and understandings. So, so any comments on that? Well, I guess I would say one thing, back to your first point about the difference between theory and application. Does that touch ground in your religious life at all? There is a lot of energy and attention among institutional religion, among people of faith and different spiritual traditions that place a great deal of stock in the, what my mentor used to call the lore of the faith. <laughs> the information and, ac and acquired wisdom, sacred writings and texts and the accumulated experience of people. The head part of spirituality. And there is an applied and experimental aspect to spirituality as well. When it touches really? ground in the midst of life. <laughs> yeah. When it touches ground in the midst of life and we find ourselves challenged or greatly affirmed or we have an opportunity to share what we believe, um, the opportunity to live out more of the head with the heart and hands. So I'd say that's a, th there's a common aspect yeah, there between exactly. the two disciplines. So this is, the, this is kind of Bob's version of the history of physics. I'm sure any physicist uh, would groan if they see this because it's so simplified. But in about 1300, the scientific method was uh, codified. People started actually using what's called the scientific method. So it's a four or five step process, beginning with a hypothesis, some testing, and then revising the hypothesis. And you do that over and over again. When in 1685, Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, invented the laws of motion and calculus. This was huge. I, I, it takes my breath away to think where we would be without calculus. Then a big period of quiet for, gosh, a couple of hundred years until uh, about 1801, people began to, to realize that light was a wave. And for in the next hundred years, nothing much happened in science vis-a-vis -vis light until 1900, people realized that energy is quantized. I'm going to talk in considerable detail about that. In 1905, 
Einstein discovered the light is quantized. He won the Nobel Prize for that. In 1923, de Broglie uh, conjured up that, that we're like light, that we have a wavelength too, even big things like people. Crazy idea. Uh, 1926 was the famous double slit experiment. Gil's going to talk a lot about that. In 1926, in 1927, the whole thing was kind of wrapped up in a ball, and the theoretical part of it was, was, was codified under the thing called the Schrodinger equation. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you that equation. And of course, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is, says that we fundamentally live in a world of probabilities, not a, not a word, world of predictabilities. Want to say anything about the history of all this? History of religions, deep, deep stuff in it. You yes, and you take a you take a big step there from this deterministic kind of world of Newtonian physics and into the more probability aspects of physics. And we have there's a lot to be said about that in terms of spirituality today. Um, we come from a time uh, in the last hundred years, especially, of a rise of fundamentalism. And we know the roots of that. We know that it is rooted in a fear in many ways uh, that, that traces itself to the First World War, the war to end all wars, the Great War, when we discovered the depths of horror that we can inflict on one another. In times of uncertainty like that, there is a tendency to grab hold of what is hard and fast and concrete. Things get very black and white in times like that. And so we see a rise of a more fundamental embrace in what heretofore was a more interpretive tradition with regard to scripture and with uh, spirituality, spirituality overall. So spirituality has made that kind of move from a determinism into more of a probabilistic mm -hmm. world as well and is still making that move. And so this is the beginning of the whole quantum uh, revolution. And and Max Planck uh, said, well, if, there's, if, if energy is quantized, if it comes in quanta, little quanta, you know what that term means? It means packet, okay? It doesn't mean anything fancy. It's just a little packet, like this is a quanta of water, okay? He, he, he posited, he said, well, maybe, just maybe, if energy comes in these little packets, this theoretical data can match the experimental data. And they did that, and they discovered this thing called Planck's constant, which is, I don't know what to call it, it's the, it's the, um, it's the seed out of which quantum physics grew. So uh, Max Planck discovered what this little, this little packet was. And I want to talk about this, because this is something that, that never comes up in these talks about quantum physics. What this constant is, they say, oh, well, that's just Planck's constant. But they never say what it is. It's just the craziest imaginable thing. It is, its value is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 34th, which means if you put down a period and you draw out 34 zeros and you put a six after it, that's what it is, okay? It's so unbelievably small. It's, and I, I computed this, I wrote this down, it's 10 million times smaller than the ratio of one meter to the edge of the universe or it's the ratio of a DNA strand to the edge of the universe. It's incomprehensibly small. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is marching through the kind of the, the stumbles that, that physics went through to eventually get to quantum physics. And the next oops is Einstein uh, saw that uh, light had a particle nature. Okay. Major discovery. Big, big, whole, a big slam into to, to classical physics. The next is, is de Broglie, and it's French, so I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, proposed that uh, since light had uh, a wavelength, maybe particles have a wavelength too. Uh, where these people come up with these intuitions is beyond me. They come mm -hmm. out of this deep place, this, this equation that E equals Planck's constant times frequency comes out of some deep place in people who, like I th think Rick's music reminds me of that when mm -hmm. I hear him play, it just comes out of, it's a, it comes out of a mis mysterious place. Um, and similarly with this, de, de, Broglie, de Broglie came up with this whacked idea 
that you have a frequency, like a packet of light has a frequency, is, is, is nutty. And you'll see that th this is in fact true. It's even true for large things with, with a trillion atoms, okay? This is the famous double slit experiment. How many people have seen this or heard about this in some way? <clears throat> but this, this, was the, uh, this was the deal breaker that made people really begin to say, hey, uh, classical physics is just all wet. Okay? We really need some new way of looking at the world. And here we are the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So. When we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> But the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently. The 
as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. <laughs> Yeah, this, this, this uh, experiment was done by Hitachi. Uh, so, uh, you know, shooting a whole bunch of uh, particles like that all at once, uh, trillions or jillions of electrons through those slits, messes things up. So they decided they were just going to shoot the particles through one at a time. Now, it turns out this, with some fairly e extensive uh, experimental apparatus, you can find one electron and shoot it through and then about a second later, you can shoot another one through. And a second later, you can shoot another one through and see what happens, okay? So let's, let's run the film and see what happens. This is a brilliant piece of experimental uh, physics. Now we are looking at the detector playing on the monitor. Bright spots appear here and there. These spots indicate individual electrons. Electrons are sent out only occasionally. Therefore, the chance of finding one electron in the microscope is very small, not to mention the chance of finding two. Uh, since electrons are detected one by one as particles, we have to conclude that each electron must have passed through at random on either side of the biprism, thus creating a uniform distribution without any interference when accumulated. Under such condition do electrons form a uniform distribution? But look, we begin to see some fringes in the perpendicular direction that looks like interference fringes. Since this experiment lasted for more than 30 minutes, I have sped the movie up. Interference fringes are now clearly visible. So people that were saying, well, you're cheating by shooting all those electrons through, they're just interfering with each other, they're shooting them through one at a time and they're doing that, okay? So this is, this is the craziness of the quantum world. You want to say anything about that? Well, how are they able to monitor this without observing? Because one of the mysteries in this to me is that observation fundamentally <laughs> changes the right. behavior they weren't in observing quantum. they weren't observing which slit it went through they were just observing the the sheet that, that the electrons hit on in the back okay and they were observing it later yeah. Let me see. now this 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 is the uh, death this is the stab in the heart of of um, classical physics classical physics says if you know what's happening right now and you can measure it very accurately position, momentum, you know a baseball's traveling through the air, you can predict with unbelievable accuracy where it's going to be a second from now or a millisecond from now, and ultimately where it's going to land, okay? So that's the, that's the uh, deterministic world that, that physics was living in. And Heisenberg discovered that, uh, that we live in a probabilistic world. In other words, if you take uh, the the uh, position and the momentum of a particle, and you try to measure the position really accurately, the, the momentum it has gets very fuzzy. You, you don't know, you don't know what, how, how much energy it has. On the other hand, if you try to examine where, how much energy it has, its momentum, you don't know where it is. Okay? This is so these things squeeze each other. These are called conjugate pairs, is the, 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 the physics term for this. Uh, energy and time are, are the same way, but this is, the, this is the one that says we live in a world of probabilities. We can't know exactly what's happening. If we try to know exactly what's happening, everything else gets fuzzy. Okay? So the next slide is the, is the reason that I wanted to give this talk. And this is what I'm hoping you'll leave here with, is uh, some modest understanding of this, this, this slide. This is the definition of what quantum physics is, okay? 
The first thing is that the configuration of a particle, whether it's an electron going through a slit or a baseball flying through the air, is, is determined by a wave function. Okay. The first assumption of quantum physics is that every configuration, position, momentum, energy, anything about a particle is represented as a wave. So we live in a world of waves. You're a wave. Okay. Electrons are waves. The second is the meaning of that wave function. The meaning of the wave is the probability uh, of finding a particle in a particular place. So the meaning of the wave is a probability, okay? It's not this particle is exactly right here. It's probably right here to a degree of 90%, okay? So the meaning of the wave is a probability, and there's a, there, there are ways mathematically to compute that probability. I won't bore you with that. This is the beating heart of quantum physics is number three. Given two configurations of a system, there's always the possibility of having something in between, okay? There's not two. Is if there's this and that, there's everything in between. Well, there's a lot to be said about this too from a standpoint of spirituality because we are inheritors of received traditions and practices and belief systems that have come down through ages and of experience and observed phenomena and consequences. And it's very easy to step into a place where all of that is shaking and quaking because of new developments and things that are much more open-ended than the deterministic received traditions that we have been brought up in or that have been handed down to us. There is a strong sense from, th from Hebrew Testament through the Christian witness of an interconnectedness of all things. And I don't want to proclaim on one hand that the writers of sacred texts like the Hebrew and Christian scriptures or the Quran or any of the other sacred texts that are, that are so vibrant and, and real uh, are, are brought about through a scientific methodology. But this idea that there is a common experience reality in which we all live and move and breathe and have the experience of life uh, is, is foundational to a lot of understandings of what people mean when they say the word God. More and more people are finding a spirituality that is not one or the other, black and white, a polarity of this or that, good versus evil. They're finding something quantized that, that fits more with their experience of the world. We're at a threshold right now. We're at, a, we're at a point where new discoveries are coming, new ways of thinking are coming. So I hope to see enough of this, but one of my hopes also is that this is something that takes us out of a duality of scientific right. rationalism and spirituality and begins to bring the consciousness and the value of both into one enterprise. So that could be our great periodic contribution to this human project. And it's, it's, it's uh, concomitant with these scientific revolutions too, which are just huge right now. People take this science and they, they make all kinds of crazy statements about what it means to us. So, so because there's so much space between the electrons, you can really stand in front of a bus and it will pass through you, okay? Is this where the theory I, I, diverges from the I experimental? I challenge you to run that experiment, okay? That's what I mean by woo-woo. People just, people that don't understand this science make all kinds of outrageous claims about what it means. Mystery, this is, if there's any, any word to take away from this talk, we live in such unbelievable scientific mystery. But, but this, is, this is quantum mechanic. It's completely shocking that the systems can be reduced to this, this wave equation. This is a little piece of mathematics. Is, that's a plus sign, by the way. That's not any magical thing. And that's just a number, and that's a number, and that's a wave. That's one wave right there. That's another wave right there. And what, what this says is if there's this wave and this wave, there's always going to be another wave, which is the addition of those waves. So when you put that little I in there, you've added in another piece, and it changes everything. This explains all of the quantum weirdness. But this is taking us out of a place where science has been the area of knowing and empirical proofs and 
solidity and truth over against this area that is belief. And we hear a professor at MIT saying we're going to dispense with this word about knowing and we're going to begin to understand things as they happen. And religion can be just as pedantic and just as dogmatic and insist on its ways and its forms, and only is, to find those things yeah. failing us or changing and not behaving predictably in the reality of our lives. So I feel an incredible freedom that comes from this, that I'm not bound by dogma, and I'm not bound by ironclad deterministic physics and mathematics. This opens up a realm of possibility that's hugely refreshing and freeing. Uh, they, they run experiments out in California where they count alpha particles coming in to the, to hitting, hitting a plate, and they hit at a certain frequency pretty regularly all the time. And when there's a war, like the thing that happened in Syria the other day, those alpha particles really increase enormously. We live in a very mysterious universe, and maybe that's the, that's the, the, the takeaway from this talk. So, Somebody says, well, what do quantum physicists do, okay? What they do is they fiddle with this equation. That's how they came up with semiconductors. That's how they came up with MRI machines. That's how they came up with lasers. They just fiddle with this equation. So I just, I just for, dri for grins, I just fiddle with this equation. So here's the setup. There's a little particle, that's that little dot up there, and it's sitting, it's sitting in, a, in, a, in a little box, okay? Uh, and it can't go outside the box on this side or that side. For this little system of one little particle in a box, it can never have zero energy. It's not possible for it to have zero energy. It's got to have some little energy. Now, that doesn't sound so nutty, right? I mean, of course. But the other thing it says is the probability of where that particle is in the uh, box changes with its energy. That's not surprising, right? If you put a very energetic particle in a box, it's gonna change its position. This is the shocker. There are places in the box where the particle can never be. So if somebody says they think they understand quantum physics, good luck, little Eva. You know, this is just, this makes you crazy. Here's some really great quotes. I love these quotes. <clears throat> Anyone who is not, so I hope you can relate to these quotes yourself. Anyone who's not shocked by quantum theory has not understood it. Niels Bohr. <laughs> when Schrodinger got a Nobel Prize, he said, I do not like it. I am sorry I have ever had anything to do with it. Because it makes you crazy, okay? It makes you crazy. <clears throat> and this is a beautiful quote of Einstein. As far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. <laughs> Once again, mystery. Be these deep, deep scientists live in the total mystery. Feynman, when he got his Nobel Prize, also said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And my favorite is, it is no wonder that truth is stranger than fiction, because fiction has to make sense. <laughs> and I think that harmony is there. I think that convergence is there. He certainly thought so. And I think that that opens up enormous possibility for humanity because the same things that have enabled us, with our limited understanding, we sure have been able to make use a lot of, this, of a lot of these scientific phenomena, to do astounding things. And I think those in concert with things of the spirit related that has a humanistic quality to it. Our problems are solvable. When we have the capacity to explore and imagine our way into the world as complex as it is, we have the opportunity in the imagination to solve the problems that face us culturally as well. So I'm enormously gratified and hopeful just based on the sense of spirit that is also hand in glove with the, the rationalistic and scientific pursuits of these phenomenal people. It's encouraging. You know, my summary of this talk, somebody asked me uh, <clears throat> earlier today, they're gonna miss the talk, and they said, what, what am I missing? And I said, 
that we live in a probabilistic world, that we're not separate, and uh, religion and science are not at odds with each other. Next slide. You want to say anything about that? I agree. This is my favorite slide of the whole, the whole thing. And I hope tonight that we have been able to walk you through a little bit of the science, enough of a peek into that looking glass that you can understand this quote, okay? That really it's quite marvelous what's down there, that there's this thing called superposition. What a crazy business that is. <coughs> But the great, great granddaddy of wacky quantum weirdness is entanglement. If time reversal symmetry destroys the notion of time, then entanglement crushes our experience of space. Two objects, two electrons created together, are entangled. Send one to the other side of the universe. Now, do something to one, and the other responds instantly. Instantly. So, either information is traveling infinitely fast, or, in reality, they are still connected. They are entangled. And, since everything was entangled at the moment of the Big Bang, that means Everything is still touching. Space is just the construct that gives the illusion that there are separate objects. Are we far enough down the rabbit hole yet? <laughs> That's great. Good find, Gil. Um, you know, I often say this to kids that I tutor. Uh, I ask them, I always ask them, what is mathematics? And they say, well, it's just numbers and equations and getting the right answer to the back of the book. No, mathematics is not that. It's the formal study of relationships. Anything that's in relationship to anything else can be studied mathematically. I love this. There are four ways to win. Pray, be smarter, be faster, or cheat. Of these, only the first brings peace to the heart. So if you want to uh, see the notes to this talk, they're out there on bringmewater.org slash quantum quantum. Okay?